Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette. Looks like I'm live now, so this is where we get some philosophy off the internet and read it. It's uh, academic stuff, so if you have academic stuff you want me to read, please send it over and I might read it online and give you feedback. And people like feedback, so you should do it. Um, otherwise, sometimes I just see what's new or just do a journal I haven't looked at in a while or have not looked at ever. I've been thinking about doing that a little bit more because there are so many philosophy journals. I mean, look at this. It's insane. And there's a whole bunch of really good ones that I realize don't make it to the front page of a uh, full paper. So I'm like, just been looking at some of the ones I haven't looked at in a while or haven't looked at at all just because they don't show up on the front page of what's, uh, uh, on the front page of felt papers that's basically it and it's not even to say that uh there's lots of great stuff so uh see this is one of the, this is a good journal right here american philosophical quarterly never clicked on it before so it's like we'll find out i was just uh okay oh look at all these short oh that's right they double column in american philosophical quarterly so these are like twice as long as they think not everything's this actually as short as it is double columned okay so have to be wary of the uh, page lengths here so let's see what uh is forthcoming uh they don't have page numbers on their forthcoming okay so we're only gonna do stuff from last year then which really wasn't that long ago Okay. Ooh, deflating truth about taste. That sounds fun. Okay, so have to be slightly careful. Evidence and self-fulfilling belief. Evidence and self-fulfilling belief. Ooh, twice. Good for you. Get uh, two times in the uh, journal. Uh, it's uh, there's 13 pages on Christian theism, unrestricted concept. Mastering Mary, a capacitive account of memory, epistemological disjunctivism. There's only a level page, 11 pages, so I should be reading the page numbers. This is 11, that's kind of reasonable. I mean, it's probably like 20, uh, so we'll have to take a look at this stuff. This is 13, nope, not gonna do that one. 15, no. This is nine, maybe do that. 13, this is uh, 11. Uh, I can't add. This seems like nine. Ability and the past. Hmm. Being more blameworthy is 13. No. Uh, let's see. We got 12. 12. Uh, 13. 10. Modesty as an executive virtue. That's 14. Uh, this is 15. Nine. Fifteen. Do I have any? Ooh, disembodied animals. Fourteen pages I'm not reading. I was like, why do you want to disembody animals? That seems mean. Hylomorphic version of animalism. Which human per person survives as immaterial bodiless animals after death. Okay. Let's click on it because that just sounds so much fun. Disagree with myself, Dr. Axis. Commitment and interpersonal d disagreement. I mean, I've looked at this stuff before. It's good, but I'm just like, I don't, not in the mood for it. But I click on it. All right, so this is getting through the whole page here. This is about taste versus about moral issues. Um, could be fun. Aesthetics versus uh, uh eth ethics versus aesthetics. Evidence and self-fulfilling belief. Uh, not happening. Okay. Uh, so I shouldn't have done that. I should have just clicked on click on scholar. Um. Okay. Let's, see. Let's pull that one back up. No access. Find on scholar. I did not click export citation. I really did not. Now it's not working. Go away. Export citation. Well, you're not getting your paper read because the web page broke. Aha, so we have this one here. Let's see how long it is. Uh, can't 
find it. Nope. Okay. A period Yetter Chappelle. He has a blog. I've seen that. Uh, I guess this would be 21 pages. Yeah. Well, is it double spaced or not double spaced? Yeah, single. Oh, it is double spaced. Okay. So that's reasonable. Sounds fun. 19, but single spaced. Yeah, it's a little scary to me. Uh, let's see. We got this one. Not available. And let's see what this one says. 17. And teeny. Okay. But it's a. Yeah. All right. So what do we got? This one. This one. This one is twenty-one, but well, only kind of double-spaced. Still pretty scares me. Oh, what is this one? Um, this is sixteen, and not quite double-spaced and very wide. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. So now we get to choose between lots of things I don't, lengths of papers I don't really want to read. Uh, okay, so we've got epistemological disjunctivum and the internalist challenge. Uh, why care about non-natural reasons? Uh, disembodied animals. And disagreement about taste versus disagreement about moral issues. Okay, I like these two topics more. They sound more fun to me. Uh, sorry, sorry. And this is 19 and... They're about the same size, really, because this the font here is teenier, but it's they're both like a LaTeX uh, typeset. So seventeen. Well, I'm just sorry. Let's see. All right. In this paper, I defend hylomorphic version of animals in accordance which we survive as immaterial bodiless animals after death, according to the hylomorphic. I am assuming soul survives death according to animals. I'm assuming I'm, I am necessarily an animal. Uh, we don't. Okay. Something about hylomorphism. The aim of this paper is to argue against a growing tendency to assimilate moral disagreements to agreements about my personal taste. The only strategy adopted in this paper appeals to a battery of linguistic criteria that reveal interesting important. All right, I'm sorry. This is just more after. I like this paper. It sounds like fun, but this one's more after my heart. So we're reading this one. As I've said before, philosophers are people, and a lot of random stuff goes into a lot of the uh, decisions that are made. So, you think like, oh, these are important topics? No, sometimes it's just, you know, historic accident, historical accident is why anything happens. I mean, you can always make up a reason if you want, but that doesn't always mean it's a... Uh, as important as you, like it might really be the way things are, but that doesn't mean it was like super important at the time or is not what you think it is. Very little is what you think it is. <laughs> okay, and if you join me live, um, which I always hope you do, you can grab a copy of the link to the uh, Phil Papers page by typing exclamation point uh, paper in the chat box, and it's in the uh, show notes if you're watching this uh, below, if you're watching this after the fact. Okay. You know what, I might even zoom in a little because this is small. And I've said this before, but I love this PDF viewer. It's called Ocular. Um, I think it's put out by the KDE Foundation. It's just been so nice to use. Um, like all these little like annotation features here. It, it's just been... I was looking around. I was like, oh my god, this thing is great. Okay, enough of my uh, complaining about other stuff. Disagreements about taste versus disagreements about moral issues. The phenomenon of faultless disagreement has been one of the most discussed topics in philosophy of language over the past 15 years. It has triggered a great deal of interest in predicates of personal taste, hence for PPTs. Predicates of personal taste, PPTs, as, such as delicious and fun, not only in philosophy but also in linguistics. By faultless disagreement, I mean the uncontroversial observation that there are situations in 
which the two parties appear to be disagreeing, but at the same time there does not appear to be any clear objective way of telling who is right. The puzzle, puzzling observation is typically presented via dialogues of the following form. Nariko, this is delicious. Suleiman, no it isn't. <laughs> This is really how we do this. I didn't know. That. I don't read like this literature, but like this is like this is how we typically do stuff. This is delicious. No, it's not. It's like what are we five again? I mean, I think that is a lot of philosophers' discussions are like between five-year-olds, and we're just trying to figure out what a five-year-old is saying. It's like maybe this is not how we should be uh, judging what is going on. Um, and this isn't a uh, criticism of this author. It's typically represented. Uh, I mean, that's sort of the state of state of affairs okay let the dialogue be taking place in a restaurant and let this refer to freshly chopped parsley well parsley is nice suppose that parsley tastes delicious to Noriko but awful to Suleiman then it seems that neither of them is at fault in what they are asserting or at any rate that neither of them is wrong in the same way as the one who asserts say that Yerevan is in Syria at the same time the conversation in one looks like disagreement, which is indicated by the use of negation part of the negation particle no, followed by Suleiman's assertion, the negation of the sentences asserted by Noriko. This paper is not concerned with the question of how best to account for faultless disagreement. Rather, it is concerned with the question of whether disagreements about matters of personal taste are to be explained in the same way as moral disagreements, which are also taken to generate Resilient disagreements, disagreements that cannot be resolved in any straightforward way by appealing to matters of fact. Consider Noriko. This is morally wrong. Suleiman, no it isn't. Let this refer to a certain action that is approved by the, of by the system of moral values endorsed by Suleiman, but disapproved of by the one endorsed by Noriko. To make it concrete, let them be talking about Suleiman's enjoying porn movies. Our question is then whether... The disagreement in 1 and 2 ought to be accounted for in the same way. This may be the first time I've ever heard someone uh, equi uh, uh, make a comparison between uh, freshly par chopped uh, parsley and porn movies, but that's why you read philosophy for weird comparisons. Of course, 1 and 2 di differ in that, well, one's about parsley, one's about porn. Although they both begin with the letter P. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by the letter P. Different in that one, gustatory concerns gustatory taste and two, morality. But once we abstract over their respective domains, do one and two display the same pattern? Common sense will answer no. Most of us are happy with the idea that our gustatory preferences may diverge and that in such cases there is no point in arguing whether something tastes delicious, as the proverb has it, de gustibus non disputatum. Disputandum. You know, it's interesting because I used to hate yogurt and when I was a like, little kid, and now I love yogurt. I, like, I have it almost every morning. So, I'm not sure that, like, you can, like, mature in your taste. So, it could be, like, there's immaturity in uh, gustatory preferences, too. So, it's not that it's not disputable. Because, you like, someone you could be, like, they have an uncultured palate. I mean, pretension is part of the job description of being a philosopher. So that's okay if, that I can say that. <laughs> um, so it's like, I'm not sure that just be, even though there is a sense in which everyone can have their own taste, that doesn't make it always right. I mean, yes, they may like something, but I used to love fast food. Now it's not as good to me. And I take that not as an object. I wasn't objectively happy back then. I just it, sort of just didn't understand what was going on. I was like, like the sugar too much. Okay. By contrast, we would balk at the thought that our moral preferences may diverge and that there is no point in arguing whether a given action was morally acceptable or not. Even the phrase moral preference may make us uncomfortable because we take morality not to be a matter of preference. If someone tells you that they prefer to listen to reggaeton over jazz, you may think that they have bad taste in music, but after all, it's their choice. Um, I may like to listen to reggaeton at certain times, and jazz at other times it's like yeah so it's you, you got to take these things graded so it's a little weird to um it's like if they hate jazz then i'd be like well why do you hate jazz i'd find that weird but wanting to listen to reggaeton is not a problem it's like yeah you can get fast food sometimes it's okay 
You may think that they have bad taste in music, but after all, that's their choice. But if someone tells you that they prefer a system that allows for owning slaves and treating them as one pleases, you will not think it's their choice. Rather, you will consider such a person as a wrongdoer who has serious problems with morality. The, exam the aim of this paper is to further substantiate the view that disagreements over matters of personal taste pattern differ matters of personal taste pattern differently from moral disagreements. The paper is organized as followed. Section 2 lays out the general structure of the argument and situates the view vis-a-vis -vis the dominant tendencies in the literature. Section 3 and 4 provide theoretical and empirical evidence to the effect that expressions of personal taste behave differently from expressions of moral value. Section 5 argues that these linguistically tractable differences have significant repercussions for the nature of disagreements on in the two domains. Um, I mean, my initial gut check reaction is, of course, and as I've said before, these people who, these philosophers, they are very, very, very smart. If you're thinking something, it's likely because they want you to be thinking it. Um, but my initial gut check reaction is that they're tracking two phenomenologically different um, things. And so the aesthetic one is tr uh, treating something more reactive, like this is how it, I react to this. And that's why we say, well, look, there's nothing wrong with how you react because you're human and that's okay. The aesthetic, the ethical one is not reactive. It's more of a, a cognitive thing that we sort of reflect upon. And that's why we can have disagreements about it. But let's see where this author is taking it. The intended take-home message of this paper is that we should neither assume nor strive for uniform account of disagreements over matters of taste and moral disagreements. As already pointed out, the position defended here is supported by common sense. Um, I wouldn't always assume common sense is right, though. One may wonder, then, why there should be any need to argue for such a position. The reason is that the dominant trend appears to go in the opposite direction. This section begins with a rough overview of these trends and continues with an outline of the observations developed in the remainder of the paper that raise serious worries for the prospects of offering a uniform account of the two kinds of disagreement. Simplifying greatly, there seems to be three main tendencies in the literature with regard to whether disagreements about taste and moral disagreements behave alike. To assume without further ado that a uniform account is appropriate, to seek a uniform account based on explicitly stated motivations, to express caution regarding the prospects of a uniform account. My targets in this paper are 1 and 2. To, I hope to demonstrate that the assumption made in 1 is not only unwarranted but promises to be incorrect. Furthermore, I will argue that the motivations typically appealed to in 2 are insufficient to warrant a preference for a uniform account, given that there exist important differences between judgments of personal taste and moral judgments. The conclusions at which I will arrive may be seen, then, as vindicating the cautious attitude in 3. The assumption that PPTs and moral predicates are behave alike, and that relatedly disagreements over behaviors of personal taste and disagreements over moral issues also behave alike appear to be dangerously widespread assumption. In his pioneering defense of relativism, Max Kolbel presents us, presents us from the outset with the sentences, licorice is tasty and cheating on one's spouse is bad, as illustration of, of one and the same phenomenon. Ever since, there has been a robust tendency to assume that PPTs, moral predicates, and various other expressions such as aesthetic and epistemic predicates all belong in one and the same batch of expressions that raise the same sort of challenge and call for the same sort of explanation. The assumption is commonly slid into the common ground without being explicitly stated, as the opening words of Marquez illustrate. When people have disagreements about taste or about aesthetic or moral values, what is their disagreement about? The danger behind one is that we can find that is that we find this assumption in a number of influential proposals. In the relativist camp, besides Colbell's approach, we find it, for instance, in Richard, as well as in Egan, and although McFarlane does not explicitly discuss moral predicates, his endeavor to apply his assessment relative framework to PBTs as well as to the deontic modal ought also reveals a tendency towards a uniform account. In the contextualist camp, the assumption underlies, among other, the metalinguistic approach in Plunkett and Sundell, and Sundell, and the discourse contextualist approach in Silk. To be fair, it is not always clear that an author simply takes the preference for a uniform account for granted rather than doing so on a motivated basis. In Colville's case, the idea that disputes about whether licorice is tasty and about whether cheating on one's spouse is bad are both perceived as giving rise to faultless disagreement 
could be seen as motivation for a uniform account. Indeed, in later work, he adduces four types of motivation, what he calls basic evidence, namely that certain dialogues involving the relevant expressions appear to give rise to faultless disagreement, two, object language assessments of what is said, object language speech reports, oh, that's three is object language speech reports, for the behavior of a given expression with respect to modification by a four phrase. For, for it, similarly, it could be said that McFarlane's endeavor to provide a uniform account of PBTs and the deontic ought is motivated by phenomena such as third-party assessment, retrospective assessment, and various norms of assertion and retraction. In the contextualist camp, it can be suggested that the approach in Plunkett and Sundell, and Sundell draws motivation from the idea that PPTs, moral and aesthetic critics, all behave alike with respect to phenomena of metalinguistic negotiation. Last but not least, Crispin Wright highlights four features that he takes to be exhibited by both basic taste and basic moral judgments faultlessness, contradiction, sustainability, and parity. He then relies on the assumption that these four features together summarize both kinds of judgments to propose a unified account of disagreements about taste and disagreements about moral issues. <coughs> okay. It goes beyond the scope of the present paper to examine the motivations that these different authors adduce and rely on. Fortunately, this will not be needed for my main, for my aim is not to establish a uniform account for my aim is not that to establish that a uniform account is impossible. My aim is more modest. Against the tendency one, I want to show that it is wrong to assume without further ado that moral judgments naturally belong in the same broad family as judgments reflecting personal taste. Against the tendency in two, I want to put pressure on those authors who seek uniform account of PBTs and moral predicates based on certain types of motivation, such as typically intuitions about disagreement, by confronting them with the certain significant, significant differences between these two classes of predicates, which in turn provide motivation against a uniform account. The core observations in this paper make the core observations that this paper makes are simple and can be summarized as follows. Judgments of personal taste are sensitive to, to experience in a way that moral judgments are not. This experience sensitivity is a feature that languages typically encode and that gets reflected in the semantics of PPTs without having its equivalent in the semantics of moral predicates. Finally, this semantic, semantically encoded feature has repercussions on the expression and the interpretation of claims regarding personal taste, which in turn have an impact on our understanding of scenarios in which people disagree about issues of personal taste. By contrast, disagreements about moral issues are not affected by experience sensitivity in an, in an analogous way. In any analogous way. Yeah, so here's where we're going. Experience sensitivity this is something like what I was saying above. Okay. The remainder, of the, the remainder of the paper proceeds as follows. Section 3 and 4 seek to establish the presence of experience sensitivity with respect to PPTs and its absence in the case of moral predicates. Section 3 relies on standard theoretical methods from semantics, namely tests that reveal systematic differences in behavior between paradigmatic PPTs, such as tasty, and paradigmatic moral predicates, such as wrong. These methods, however, have certain shortcomings since the tests that they use which look at the behavior of a given expression with respect to other constructions need not always explicit, elicit robust felicity judgments and can be contextually manipulated. This is why in section 4 I will gesture towards empirical data combining statistical findings and dis disappointingly few experimental studies to bolster the claim that PPTs, not moral predicates, are experience sensitive. Section 5 discusses the impact that these semantic differences have on moral, on disagreements over taste versus moral issues. Uh, so this is going to be like experimental philosophy. That's kind of interesting. I was not expecting that. Okay. Disentangling PPTs from moral predicates. Some preliminaries regarding methodology and taxonomy. Although I have been talking about PPTs versus moral predicates as if the two were easily distinguishable, it must be acknowledged that the two classes are not separated in any neat way in English and in most other languages. An immediate challenge comes from all purpose evaluatives, evaluatives, adjectives, such, from all purpose evaluatives, adjectives, I don't know this phrase, I'd say evaluative adjectives, like get rid of this ass, such as good, bad, nice, horrible, or awful, which are used with equal ease in judgments of personal taste, moral judgments, aesthetic judgments, and all sorts of other judgments. An equally pressing challenge comes from expressions that belong primarily in one class, but can easily acquire a related meaning in different 
in a different class. Adjectives such as amazing and disgusting are a case that point. They are experience sensitive and in terms of semantic criteria, they behave just like other PPTs, yet they can be and often are used to make claims about moral issues and moral values, as this corpus drawn example illustrates. The guy who killed these poor people is a horrible, horrible man and he should be hung, hanged in, a, in the park. He is a disgusting, disgusting person. Polysemy and coercion are mechanisms that allow words to shift their meaning and sometimes even grammatical category, and they are robustly entrenched in human languages. Given how widespread polysemy and coercion are, it comes as little surprise that certain generalizations made about the behavior of a given word based on the perceived infelicity of particular sentences must involve a grain of idealization. The lack of robust all-or-nothing linguistic judgment is not peculiar to theorizing about predicates, but arises in virtually any area. Uh, this is a normal thing that we are not, pres our words are, have all have multiple uses, and so you have to, the phenomenon cannot just be read off the, uh, just read off the page on which word is being used. There's no one word that just obviously goes one way or the other. And if there was, it'd be very strange and we'd have to investigate that. Okay, so how do you actually define this? Threshold sensitivity and comparative disagreements. Our main question is whether PPTs behave in the same way as moral predicates. I will argue that there are important differences between them. Recall though that we should not expect to find a clear-cut demarcation that will completely set apart the two class classes of predicates. What we should expect to find, rather, that a par paradigmatic predicates of personal taste tend to behave in one way, while paradigmatic moral predicates tend to behave another way. Importantly, the differences that I'm about to highlight do not preclude that there are, excuse me, do not preclude that there may also be important similarities between PPTs and moral predicates. One feature that many PPTs have in common with mo many moral predicates, but also many predicates many predicates of all kinds, is that they are gradable ag adjectives. Gradability is one of the most fun most discussed features of adjectives. Let me illustrate it with the help of the adjective long. Consider two train rides, one that takes three hours, another that, that takes 35 minutes. While we can truly say that the first is longer than the second, neither the meaning of the adjective long nor facts about the world allow us to decide whether for either of those we can truly say that train ride is long. The reason is that, compared to a train ride that lasts many hours or even days, such as the Trans-Siberian, a three-hour ride is short, yet compared to a short distance rides that take less than an hour, the same ride is long. One consequence of this phenomenon is that relative gradability, gradable adjectives easily give rise to faultless disagreement. If you are used to short distance rides, and I am used to rides that last for four hours, then you will be easily led to assert that the three hour ride is long, and I will be easily led to deny this. Yet there does not seem to be any objective way to adjudicate, adjudicate our dispute. Okay. Yes, things are relative. Because relative adjectives allow their thresholds to vary with the context, they give rise to disagreements that can be accounted for by pointing to the fact that the two parties fail to converge on the relevant context. That is to say, they fail to agree on what the appropriate threshold is. Um, I don't know if this is the way I would descri describe it. I mean, I don't know if there's an appropriate threshold on long. It's sort of a positional thing. Like, what position are they taking? What counts as their, what counts as their fundamental context? Um, so I don't know what threshold all right, but all right, um, more than way to uh, slice the cake, so maybe it's fine here. Given that most PPTs, moral predicates, and all purpose evaluatives are also gradable, they can give rise to disagreements that boil down to disagreements about where the threshold lies. Reconsider two. Noriko and Suleiman's disagreement whether his taking pleasure in watching porn is morally wrong does not actually require that the two of them diverge deeply in their moral judgments. Suppose that for any give, two given actions, when asked which of the two is morally better, or whether neither is better than the other, Noriko and Suleiman give exactly the same answer. We would see Noriko and Suleiman as largely agreeing in their moral judgments. Nevertheless, they could still disagree in two because they can disagree over two over the extent to which an action must deviate from their shared moral standard in order to count as morally wrong. For example, Suleiman may fully agree that it is morally better to abstain from watching porn than to do, than to do so, and still hold without inconsistency that the former, although morally worse than the latter, is not yet so bad as to count as morally wrong. Okay. 
in order to demarcate the subjectivity found in PBTs and in evaluative adjectives from mere threshold sensitivity, various authors have urged us to shift the focus of attention from the position from the positive form to the comparative form. To wit, single scale relative adjectives such as long or expensive no longer give rise to faultless disagreement when used in the comparative form considered. Rico, the train ride from Paris to Brussels is longer than the one from Brussels to Amsterdam. Suma, no, the one from Brussels to Amsterdam is longer. Rico, the soup is tastier if seasoned with parsley. Suleiman, no, it is tastier without it. Rico, taking pleasure in watching porn is morally worse than stealing books from the library. Suleiman, no, stealing books is worse. To settle the disagreement in four, which is... I've forgotten already. Oh, the temporal time difference between two different rides. For all that is required to measure the length of respective rides, while no obvious strategy can help in settling disagreements like five or, or in six. In this respect, PPTs and moral predicates behave alike, but this is not surprising since among readable adjectives, those that are relative to a single scale, such as long length, old age, and or expensive price appear to be the odd ones out. Yeah, I mean, there's, um... I mean, talking about like a you can like objective things versus non-objective things, but I mean, if you can talk about like a, this is like just uh, it just I'm not entirely uh, sorry, maybe I got a little confused for a sec, but the train ride from Paris to Brussels is longer. That's like an objective like thing on the clock. I mean, the moral and aesthetic are so that seems like a different sort of category. But I guess the uh, point holds. You can still have this comparative uh, thing in other areas, but I don't know how the difference between the uh, objective is really doing work here. Anyway, maybe I lost it for a sec. The aim of this section is to underscore a crucial aspect in which PPT is different from moral adjectives. The former, but not the latter, are experiencer sensitive. They encode in their semantic structure an argument placed for a subject who undergoes a given experience. There are two main linguistic tests that are, tests have been in, proposed to detect the presence or absence of an experiencer. The first is to see whether the adjective may be used felicitously with a two or four phrase, and the phrase modifying the adjective itself as opposed to modifying the entire sentence. Adjectives derive from verbs that denote events involving experiencers, such as exhausting or soothing, but also certain adjectives derive from both from derive from verbs that are taken to be belonging among PPTs, such as entertaining, boring, or disgusting, clearly pass this test. Here are two corpus-drawn examples. I don't really care who is who invented math. It's boring to me no matter who invented it. Step 8. Though the liquor was disgusting to our taste buds, we did visit a local Calvados distillery. Uh, okay, so boring. So I guess the point is to me, to our. So this is the, uh, the two... Um, the two uh, phrase, the two or four us. PPTs that are not derived from verbs may not yield such a neat pattern as boring or disgusting, but they are still remarkably easier to be felicitously modified by a two or four phrase than paradigmatic moral predicates. The naturalness of nine contrasts with the infelicity of 10. Fat white worms that grow in rotten logs are nourishing t and tasty to many people. Uh, Oh, this is, yeah, Felicitous is nine. Okay, nine is okay, but uh, ten. Female genital mutilation, a practice that harms thousands of girls and women, is wrong to many doctors. All this, although the speaker may try to make it clear that the intended reading of ten is that many doctors judge female genital mutilation to be wrong, the attempted modification of the adjective wrong by the corresponding two phrase sounds bad, or at any rate, remarkably worse than nine, nor does it improve if we replace it with a four phrase. This doesn't sound infelicitous to me, it just sounds like the person's a moron when they're saying it. Um, like, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm trying to understand, maybe my understanding of the use of infelicitous is wrong here, but um, is wrong for many doctors. Like, this might, I can see why someone would make this use. It'd be like, if you were talking to somebody who thought female gen general mutilation was a good thing, why I don't have any clue but you'd say look all these doctors these people like uh, it's an appeal to authority here um so like if you had to specify which doctors as an appeal to authority um 
but it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like it's a dumb scent, like a, a in something you'd have to really. You're really trying to break things down for somebody here. It doesn't. It would be. This is a ten is unusual, but I don't see it as um necessarily infelicitous in the sense that it can't be said. I mean, I think it makes sense, but only in a very narrow context. Okay. The second test that has been proposed to detect adjectives with experiencers is whether they can be used in, used felicitously with the, fi the verb find, as in cold oatmeal. The idea sounds disgusting, but I can't stomach another bite of hot oatmeal, so I try, so I try it and find it delicious. Okay, okay. So the idea sounds disgusting, but I can't stomach another bite of hot oatmeal, so I try it and I find it delicious. Okay. However, this test may be treacherous because adjectives that arguably do not come with ex an experience or argument can, in suitable context, felicitously co-occur with find. Thus, presented with a 70 euro bill for a one-person meal, you might say, I find this meal expensive. And the fact that 12 sounds felicitous, yet not yet evident that expensive encodes an experience or argument. Rather, we argue that McNally and Stoyanovich the speaker of 12 is conveying that they are judging the meal to be expensive based on their previously experience with meal prices. Thus, is, thus appearances notwithstanding, the find construction introduces an experience or argument, even if the argument is not lexically associated with the embedded adjective embedded under find. The fact that find can easily force the introduction of an experiencer by the mechanism of coercion will not yet it will not yield infelicity results that are neat as one might wish when applied to moral adjectives nevertheless it can be argued that there is a pronounced preference for doxastic for a doxastic phrase such as believe or consider over the experiential phrase find mainly doctors consider find female genital female genital mutilation to be wrong Okay. If we want 13 to be a claim of many doctors' moral judgments on female genital mutilation, then we will prefer to use consider rather than find. This is not to say that find sounds impossible in such constructions, but as repeatedly stressed, what we are seeking to establish is that the experienced sensitive adjectives such as disgusting or tasty occur with a much greater ease and propensity with experiential constructions for to and find than moral predicates do. Okay, so this is reasonable uh what they're saying here author saying because even though they're saying this is infelicis we're talking gradable and so you have to sort of do a lot more work to make sense of that which is what they eventually got to here so this is just a little bit i mean they spelled it out god forbid they actually were like they took some time and made everything clear all right <laughs> sorry <laughs> empirical evidence for experience sensitivity my aim is to show that, from a linguistic point of view, moral predicates do not function in quite the same way as PPTs. So far, I have appealed to the theoretical evidence for a distinction, which appeals to two criteria for diagnosing the presence of an implicit experience or argument, both of which rely on felicity judgments. However, one may be left with a slight feeling of frustration because felicity itself is not... Yeah. Oh my god, this person knows what they're talking about. Okay. It comes in degrees and is sensitive to context. And if a moral predicate can be made with the help of the context to sound felicitous in a construction that aims to detect experience sensitivity, then one may wonder whether we have any solid evidence for the distinction. The issue is actually much broader than the case of PPTs versus moral predicates and relates to questions about, how, about semantic methodology and metasemantics. How can we draw any conclusions from judgments of felicity if these turn out to be matters of degree and vary with context due to the similarity Similar con concerns, researchers in semantics are growingly, growingly keen to consolidate their theory with empirical findings. Uh, you know, I think this is called a split infinitive. Is this a split infinitive? I haven't seen, like, I was reading some, oh uh, man, this might be a split infinitive. I'm not sure. But like, it's a grammatical construction that doesn't get used too much. <coughs> okay. The first kind of empirical evidence related to the present debate is quantitative evidence. In a nutshell, instead of picking out a predicate, putting it into a two or four or fine construction, and asking ourselves how felicitous the result sentence sounds to us, the idea is to see how likely that sort of construction is to occur in natural discourse and text. In different terms, the idea is to look for quantitative measures that reveal a difference in behaviors of PPTs on the one hand and moral predicates on the other hand. 
Quantitative approaches of this sort are used in computational linguistics, although applications to tooth conditional semantics and in particular to the semantics of adjectives have been scarce so far. A notable exception exception is Sassoon 2013 who uses quantitative data to motivate the division between unidimensional and multidimensional adjectives as well as some subdivisions among the latter. Although to my knowledge no extensive study has been conducted to compare the behavior of PBTs and moral predicates, some relevant preliminary evidence is reported in McNally and Stoyanovich who examined a representative sample from the British national corpus involving the find construction. Their findings reveal a sharp contrast between, on the one hand, all-purpose evaluatives, good, bad, great, excellent, mediocre, awesome, and aesthetic evaluatives, beautiful, pretty, ugly, gorgeous, which hardly ever appear with the fine construction, and, on the other hand, experience or sensitive adjectives, difficult, hard, easy, interesting, which appear with much greater frequency. To be sure, this pilot study does not yet provide conclusive evidence that would clearly demarcate PPTs and moral predicates. However, it does point to a promising direction of research that could corroborate the theoretical claims made in the last section. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you could do some sort of like a, ling uh, a big data study where you just get a whole bunch of books and search for the uh, relative distance between the two words. Um, like... Are there a greater distance between the like the aesthetic value which are defined and then the two and stuff like that? You could just count like the distance in like words, and you could just run that like as a search. I just don't know what this sort of uh, this study was. Uh, so uh, yeah, but I mean this is like definitely doable. So this is an interesting suggestion. The second kind of empirical evidence comes from experimental research in semantics and philosophy. Experimental methodology is a recent trend in both areas, which explains why here too there are virtually no studies regarding the presence or absence of an experience or argument. Here I'll only draw attention to the recent study of Kaiser and Lee, who conducted an experiment to test the claim that PPTs involve experiencers while other multidimensional adjectives don't. The gist of their experiment was to compare context containing verbs that introduce experiencers versus verbs that do not under the assumption that a recently mentioned experiencer would more easily perceive be more easily perceived as the judge in the interpretation of PPT, that is, as the person whose taste is relevant to deciding whether something is tasty, irritating, or boring. Kaiser and Lee presented their participants with pairs of sentences of the following form. Lisa A nudged B looked at Kate. She was C irritating D smart. The stimuli contrasted Agent patient verbs, condition A, with experience and theme verbs, B, and also contrasted PPDs, condition C, with other multidimensional predicates, condition D. The participants were then asked, in whose opinion is the other person irritating smart, and could select between Lisa, Kate, and the narrator. Um, slightly worried about, like, the, some of the presuppositions built into these sort of things. Um because of the way we this is not well understood the idea is to get something uh some empirical data from asking lots of people this stuff but uh i don't know it just uh, seems very hazy to me at the moment kaiser and lee's hypothesis was that when a ppt condition c is preceded by an experiencer theme verb condition b the experiencer argument of this verb is more likely to be chosen as the judge for the ppt than is a non-experienced argument of an agent theme verb condition a while the other multi-dimensional adjectives smart are not experienced experiencer sensitive see this is what i mean like smart you can experience someone as smart you can like that could be an aesthetic thing that doesn't make it objective like this is why i'm worried because um irritating or smart you can like someone can like rub you the wrong way you can they can also can come off as clever that might actually be a one of those uh i don't like clever people sort of things um where you're it's sort of an aesthetic thing like the way someone uh acts about themselves um th that's what like smart can also mean because sort of like arrogant and uh, over intellectually uh just proud and so sorry my bias against philosophers showing here um but like <laughs> apologies to all of my audience um <laughs> but uh it's like so i'm not sure that we have the right understanding of what uh 
the adjectives are to begin with and so and how they get used all the time and so that might muddle the uh, results in these sorts of things okay so smart are not experienced or sensitive which i just disputed then there should be no such asymmetry for those. The results confirm these predictions. The patterns with experiencer theme verbs show that in contexts where an experiencer is available, it is indeed a highly preferred choice as the judge of PPTs. Additional analyses show that in conditions with experiencer theme verbs, the rate of subject opinion responses is significantly lower with multidimensional adjectives than with PPTs, indicating that multidimensional adjectives do not seek out experiencer judges as strongly as PPTs. Okay, very nice. So they got some clear results. That's excellent. To be sure, the study says nothing about moral predicates. Nevertheless, the contrast it reveals between PPTs and predicates such as SMART is a reason to expect a similar contrast to arise in a mirror study on PPTs and moral predicates. Yeah, so I guess these moral predicates are meant to be some sort of uh, sort of objective like SMART would be. Well, not objective, but according to some sort of uh, external theory. Hmm. Consequence for disagreement. All right, all right, getting there. That's a 13 of 17 pages. Almost there consequences for disagreement. In this final section, I want to examine the consequences of the semantic differences between PPTs and moral predicates for the nature of disagreement in the two cases. A major consequence is that experiencer sensitive predicates, including PPTs, are more likely to be interpretable in different ways than predicates that do not have an experiencer argument, such as moral predicates. Consider the predicate difficult, which clearly comes with an experiencer argument. Skiing is bad Skiing in bad weather conditions with poor equipment is a heavy with a heavy load is difficult. Gosh, that last one was difficult. I can't take you on the slope. It's a difficult one. All right. On this most natural interpretation, we understand 15 to mean that skiing in those conditions is difficult in general for anyone. That is to say, for any potential skier in an event of that type. In linguistic jargon, the experience or argument appears to be bound by a covert generic quantifier. While we easily interpret it, interpret 15 without knowing who said it, 16 refers to a specific event. To understand 16, we need to know which run was being referred to and who was involved in the run. In a typical scenario, the speaker of 16 will be referring to a run that they performed, and we understand that it was difficult for them to perform this run. Now consider 17, and suppose that it is said by a skiing instructor to a novice. Then we understand that the scope, the slow... <laughs> You can see my Freudian slip right there. Scope versus slope. <laughs> that the slope in question is difficult for the novice because I was doing a I was doing a, a, a reference a Freudian reference shift right there. Uh, the dicto de re. So <laughs> ah, that's funny to me. Sorry, excuse me. That's really really funny to me though. And we understand that the slope in question is difficult for the novice, but presumably not for the instructor. In the three examples, the linguistic form interacts with various features of the context, including general background knowledge to yield the most plausible interpretation. All right, that's going to be the... If anyone got that, why I'm laughing, that's the geekiest joke I'm going to get all day. And uh, I hope you actually... If anyone gets that, I hope you appreciate what just happened right there. The availability of multiple readings, by which I mean the fact that there is often more than one way of understanding who the relevant experiencers are, has a direct effect on disagreements that involve an experiencer-sensitive predicate. When the experiencer is left implicit, this provides a source of misinterpretations can generate a form of disagreement. To make the point, consider a version of 16 in disagreement-prone dialogue. Nariko. Gosh, that run on Grand Cole was difficult. Suleiman, that one... The one from Aguil Rouge was even more difficult. Noriko, what? Grand Cole was more difficult than Aguil Rouge. If we take 20 at face value, we will hear it as contradicting 19, and we'll deduce that Suleiman and Noriko disagree. However, I submit that merely looking at 19 and 20, we cannot and should not draw any conclusions as to the putative disagreement between them. The conversation in 18 and 20 is in is underdeterminate with respect to intended interpretation of the experience or argument. One possibility is Norik for is that Noriko is stating that for her the run on Grand Cole was more difficult than uh, Yil Rouge. Another possibility is that she, she takes Suleiman to be making a more general statement regarding the two runs, namely that Agil Rouge was more difficult than Grand Cole for anyone who participated in both events, and she is taking issue with that. Yeah, I think this is, this analysis is correct right here. 
I mean, this is why I started laughing about De Dicto De Re, because um, one is the, she believes it for, like, for her belief versus the objectivity is uh, the intentional versus extensional sort of uh, distinction here. How can we tell which of these two possibilities is the case? Are Suleiman and Enrico merely stating that their respective appreciations of the difficulty of each run? Are they disagreeing and contradicting each other? In line with the proposal defended in Stoyanovich, Stry Stry 20. 2007, 2012, I suggest that in order to decide what is happening in dialogue such as 18 through 20, one needs to look at the context more carefully and inquire how the conversation may further evolve. If the two parties aim to disagree, we expect them to support their respective stances by arguments. For instance, Noriko might continue, I agree that Grand Cole is normally easier than Aguil Rouge, but on that run it was all ice and that's what made it super difficult. On the other hand, if the two parties aim to relate their own experiences of the difficulty involved, we expect them to qualify their statements with first personal devices. For example, Sumalaman might reply, Okay, no offense taken. A Gil Rouge may have been more difficult for you, but personally, I suffered much more on Grand Cole. Additional evidence for the existence of multiple readings comes from the fact that readings can be partly disambiguated in languages such as Japanese, which uses sentential markers akin to evidentials and offers several ways of expressing 16. I'm not going to attempt to read any of those, except there's the only difference looks like no yo, there is a yo, and there's a ni. So, differences between 2 and 23 is that the last particle ni is used to elicit the approval from the interlocutor, interlocutor as in the last difficult was, the last one was difficult, wasn't it? Whereas the particle yo emphasizes that the speaker is reporting an experience of their own, which they normally don't expect to be shared by the interlocutor. interlocutor. It, 21 is neutral, but then it is not the kind of sentence that Japanese would normally use. The choice between 22 and 23 constrains the interpretation of the experience argument so that either includes the interlocutor ni or doesn't yo. That's interesting that they... um have a marker so that you can be more precise in what you mean in these cases. That is kind of, uh, well, I mean, you can always specify in English too, but I mean, this is a little bit, uh, it's built into the uh, gra grammar there. Disagreements over moral issues are normally not subject to the same range of patterns as disagreements over matters of taste because there is no experience sensitivity involved. If two parties engage in what it looks like, a disagreement over the question of which of two courses was actually morally better, they are deprived of the possibility of saying, okay, no offense taken, I can see that you prefer this course of action, but my moral preference goes the other way. Of course, this is not to say that in the case of moral disagreement, there is an objective way of adjudicating the issue. The point is rather that whatever subjectivity there may be to moral questions, it works differently from subjectivity that derives from experience of ski slope as difficult or from taking pleasure in the taste of parsley. The latter corresponds at le the level of language to experience sensitivity and because questions of taste depend in the way on our gustatory or other experience of us on object, PPTs encode this dependence in their semantic structure. As a consequence, sentences involving PPTs are subject to a range of interpretations that are simply unavailable for moral predicates which lack this kind of argument. The fact that judgments of personal taste are sensitive to experience also has important implications for the debate between contextualist and relativist approaches to the semantics of PPTs. Over the last decade, this debate has been extensively shaped by arguments that appeal to putative disagreement data. However, I have argued that the implicit experience or sensitivity of PPTs is a reason not to take dialogues that look like disagreements at their face value. The availability of multiple readings for sentences involving PPTs predicts that some of the dialogues that look like disagreements are not genuine disagreements. In such cases, the impression of disagreements should go away once the two parties make it explicit whose experience they take to be relevant. Consequently, we ought to give up the assumption that there are clear disagreement data to be relied upon in semantic theorizing, an assumption that has largely underlied the contextualism-relativism debate. Instead, a more cautious, unmethodological attitude regarding such putative data is required. To conclude, my goal in this paper has been a modest one. I have defended the idea that disagreements about matters of personal taste and disagreements about, model, about moral issues behave differently in an important respect. This idea, strongly supported by common sense, has been resisted by a number of authors from the relativist and the contextualist camps alike. 
while those authors strive to provide a unified account to explain the perceived faultlessness of disagreements about taste and the resilience of moral disagreements, I have argued that there are good reasons to refrain from seeking such a uniform account. Judgments of personal taste are sensitive to experience in a way in which moral judgments are not. Accounts that obliterate this difference are likely to misconstrue the complex nature of the disagreements in question. Okie dokie. This was a nice paper. I thought it was a uh, very well uh, laid out. Um, like I said, when you start, when I start thinking things, and then the author basically lays out stuff to uh, make it like super explicit. That's just nicely well done. I basically completely agree with this person. To tell you the truth, it's not usual that I just completely agree with someone. It's like it looks like there's um the way. I mean, I wouldn't have argued for it in the same way because just historical accent I guess like how I come at these things but basically I think they're right the aesthetic disagreements have something as I said in the beginning to do with the phenomenology which is cashed out as experiencer um, sensitive in this paper so the experiencer sensitivity is the how we understand experiencer sensitivity um, on the ontological metaphysical level was not talked about here but I think that's exactly what was going on because that's where I come from like sort of what I think about uh, in addition to the uh, semantics so this was coming at it from the semantics of these things which then showed up as I think in what you might be calling uh, the intent some sort of intentional uh, perhaps intentional context um, where it's um, dependent on the intentions of the uh, speaker so and you can have and that's a standard ambiguity that one can disagree disagree about that does not um you have to get clear about to actually understand what's being said so that applying that showing that th it shows up the this ambiguity shows up here and it's important to not conflate the two different kinds of uh uh, arguments here that like uh, the disagreements that, that are they're being conflated where one is a sort of objective disagreement in the extensional world and one is not that then you have to be uh, clear um so other than that nicely done um yeah i'm just pleased that i thought I, that freudian slip but when i said scope instead of slope um yeah that'll be the uh, geekiest joke of my day i'm pretty happy about that so, um, ooh, French. So, I hope everyone has a good day. Stay safe out there. And, uh, of course, uh, suggestions for things to be read or any other comments are welcome if you're still watching at this point. I'm very impressed. Have a good day. Bye-bye.